Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. My name is Tim Hayden, and I'll be your host. We have an awesome show for you today. Our guest is Jacob Young. Jacob is a Daytime Emmy Award winner, actor, singer, writer, and podcaster. Jacob is also known for his roles as Rick Forrester on The Bold and the Beautiful, Lucky Spencer in General Hospital, J.R. Chandler on All My Children, and most recently as Deaver on The Walking Dead. I'm overjoyed to introduce this fantastic actor. Welcome, Jacob, to the show. Oh, Tim, thanks for having me on. It's a real pleasure. I mean, you have a whole lot more I could have, because you've done so much. I just kind of kind of cut it down a little bit. How's yeah. things going? Uh, things are good. I'm, I'm currently in Nashville, Tennessee right now. Uh, I have a young protege singer, uh, pop musician, indie pop musician. He's 21 years old. And I've got him set up with a, a good friend of mine, Grammy Award winning producer, Tone Deaf. It's kind of like yeah. boom, psh, right there because you know, <laughs> that's kind of an odd, odd name for a producer. But uh, he's awesome. He's amazing. He's worked with everybody from Black Eyed Peas to Outkast to, I mean, you name it, a lot of songs that are on the radio currently. So be on the lookout for my young protege. That goes for everybody out there. Young, I call him Young Bobby D, but his name is Bobby DeMario. Um, he's got a great sound. I have to check him out. Maybe have him on the show sometime. Yes, yeah, sir. I would love to. Uh, you're a very busy man. I mean, you are into everything. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll start at the beginning. What were you? What was it like for you as a kid? Well, I mean, I I was raised um, in a divorced family. I didn't know my parents as a, a married couple ever. Uh, my mom was raising all four of us. Um, and, you know, for anybody to get in a relationship with somebody who has four kids, that was a lot for anybody to take on. So she met my stepdad. And I mean, it was it was a very rough childhood. I've, I've talked about it publicly a lot and, and I'm OK with talking about it. But, you know, he was he came out of prison from doing a six month stint and uh, he uh, for drug abuse and selling drugs and. And then, you know, they got into drugs together and, you know, it was a lot of welfare and food banks. And it was it was a I saw a lot of violence, dealt with a lot of that as a child, um, which, you know, really you know, took many years to heal from. And which is which is why I do my podcast, too, because a lot of those kids that I'm speaking on their behalf for Boys Town, they've been in worse situations than I've been in. And, um, you know, or some are or the, are very similar to my story. So. Um, my heart really goes out to that. So yeah, so childhood was, it was not easy. I was forced to grow up way earlier than I needed to, but maybe that's why I, I had the ambition to do what I have been doing all these last, gosh, how many, you know, how many years, 20 some odd years in the professional industry, because, um, I really just wanted to, um, prove myself right that I didn't have to go down that same pattern. Right. And, and Boys Town is such a great organization, too. I mean, they do some wonderful work. Uh, yes, yes, they sur sure do. Uh, Boys Town you know, has been around over 100 years, and they're continuously changing lives every single day. I've been to the campus multiple times. I've, I've, I've spent time with the kids that are, that are either in family homes or in special case scenarios. But the over, I, I guess the through line of the whole thing is, you actually see these children healing. Um, and it's really beautiful that through a education and through love, you can heal, literally heal the frontal lobe. They've done studies on it. Um, they have these, uh, these incredible machines. Only three of them are in the world. And they used to only be able to pinprint or not, I mean, see a part of the brain where on the frontal lobe, where there has been damage from a, abuse or, or, you know, have seen something or violence. And uh, it was always told that, you know, you can't heal the brain, but they've actually been able to prove that you can heal the brain. And they've been able to heal a lot of ch children that way. So I'm telling you, they're like on the precipice of a Nobel Peace Prize. The body's pretty amazing how it can bounce back and help, you know, to recover from trauma. Yeah, for sure. Well, I heard that your first job was a server in a coffee shop. <laughs> um, that's interesting. That's a, uh, but I, I didn't, my first, my first job, uh, I never worked at a coffee shop, but, uh, which is interesting because ah. there, there's a few things like on Wikipedia, I go, that's not true. Um, uh, 
No, my first job, I was pumping gas. I worked at, I worked at a gas station in Oregon because Oregon is one of the two states where you still have, there's no self-service gas. So you still have to have attendance. So I was hired by the local guy that was friends with my, my family. And uh, he hired me and I worked at a little Texaco station. And I remember I was such a little overachiever. I'd be pumping the gas and I'd be, you know, can I check your oil? And they'd be like, yeah, you know what? I haven't checked my oil. Well, that sounds like a good idea. I pop it open. And then I wash their windshields for them. And I'd be like, well, you're, I just checked all your four tires too. And your left, left back tires short a little, you know, 20 pounds of pressure. Let me go ahead and <laughs> let fill you up. And they would just be like handing me tips. And then the guy who owned the gas station for years, he's like, wait, wait, what's all that in your front pocket? I said, oh, I, was got, I got tips. He's like, I've owned this gas station for 25 years and I've never received a single tip in my life. <laughs> I said, well, you just gotta, you gotta do the right thing. So, uh, I got, I guess that just shows you how ambitious I was even at that young of an age. Yeah. I will send you that link. Uh, it was actually a promo. Some a company did on you. I'll send that link to you. It's interesting. Uh, some of the stuff they were saying on there. Oh, well, yeah, I'd like to see it. I'd like to see what other, uh, the things they fabricated or got wrong. You'll be surprised who it was. Okay. <laughs> uh, you got your, I guess, did you start your daytime as Rick Forster on Bold and Beautiful? Yeah, that was the beginning of my entire professional career as an actor. Um, that was 1997 uh, when I was hired on that show. Yeah. What was your first day like there? Oh, uh, well, you know, it was interesting because I had been put through the ringer because I was so green. I was so new. So I had multiple callbacks. Um, you know, I had screen test. I had to do a shirtless screen test. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they also were like, "Hey, by the way, uh, Adrian France likes to sing. Do you want to sing a song with her?" And I'm like, "I'm like, am I not going to get the job if I don't?" Well, they're like, "Well, maybe we might incorporate it into the story." They're like, "So I was like, sure." So I remember rehearsing at Adrian's house. This is before I ever signed the contract. I got you, babe, by Sonny and Cher. <laughs> And, and so right after this, like, screen test, lovemaking, passionate moment thing, and, and then standing up and doing singing, I've got you, babe, with my shirt off. I was like, what <laughs> the heck is going on here? That so, kind of takes you back to some of the old 70s uh, shows they showed about screen, do, people doing screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. It was, uh, it was definitely an interesting uh, an interesting experience. But so by that time, I guess to answer your question, I had already met with wardrobe. I'd met with the producers. I'd met, you know, I'd already met John McCook, Ka Catherine Kelly Lang. Everybody was already becoming very friendly with me. So I felt comfortable, but I was also scared to death because, you know, I saw 50 people doing jobs that had no idea what they were doing because I had never been on a professional set at that point in my life. So, you know, there's a lot of technical aspects you need to learn that there was just, I was, again, it was a crash course. So um, there was, there was times where it became very challenging, you know, the amount of dialogue, especially for any young person to be able to learn how to memorize like that, that's a trained muscle within itself. So that, that was also kind of a crash course, but Ultimately, you know, six months later, I was nominated for my first Emmy. So that's when I went, well, maybe college can wait. And this is going to be the, the my career. Well, I mean, you started the hard way. Well, what I consider the hard way without any, you just did it without any help, without any education, any background or anything. Well, I mean, without any like, like studying at a class in Los Angeles, right. TV film, I, I had done theater, I, you know, I, in school. I've been in multiple choirs, love singing played harmonica from the age of five. So I always had the ability. Um, I just didn't ever think that I had a chance in hell that I was going to ever make it into Hollywood um, being so far you know, disconnected from that. Uh, but the work ethic, and I, this is what I try to tell the youngsters out there is, is I had a work ethic that, you know, was, was a lot like most people that become successful. I mean, you look at like these, these billionaires, most of them, had, you know, I, I read this statistic the other day, most of them have uh, ADD or they're, you know, dyslexic or they have, but they have to work that ex that much harder to be. So right. 
and I, and I talked to these kids recently because I was just up in Virginia at the, the Hampton uh, academies up there. And I said, guys, there's a misconception that's going on around this generation. And this generation, it's, this misconception is, is that you guys aren't willing to work for anything that, that, that's out there, that you're all instant gratification. And I don't believe that. I think you all have it in you. You just have to, you have to light that fire. You have to ignite it inside yourself and know what you want and go after it. Well, I mean, it had to be hard because at such a young age and the demand, I mean, the demand, especially on daytime drama is you're doing 40, 50 pages in a day and that's 12 hours a day. You're, I mean, you didn't have a life and at such a young age, wasn't that kind of hard not wanting to go do things? Well, it didn't stop me from doing things. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I mean, I was 17 going on 18. I had just rented my first apartment in Beverly Hills. Like I was on cloud nine. I was like, you know, visiting every coffee shop and diner across Los Angeles because I couldn't, you know, I couldn't drink or go to a nightclub or anything like that. I was still too young, but I was living on my own. So it was a really kind of a, I don't know, like a very proud moment to, to see that all unfold so quickly. So, but, but yeah, it was, I don't know. I take a lot, I took a lot of pride in that. It was scary being on my own and not knowing how to cook or, you know, <laughs> do simple tasks, you know? Right. Well, towards the end of your first stint on Bold and the Beautiful, was there a particular reason that you wanted to move on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the main, you know, the main reason was, you know, my team, you know, they were, they, you know, I was signed with already with UTA at that time, which is a pretty large agency. And, you know, they, they wanted me to start making that transition into primetime TV, then ultimately into film. And that's pretty much goes, is a story with a lot of young actors out there. You don't want to stay on something for too long in order to make that transition. But again, it was a little bit, uh, premature in my opinion. Um, I had to go back through like the, the troubles and strifes of not having an income come in. You know, you're paying an agent, you know, 10%, you're paying a manager 15%, you're paying accountants, you're paying taxes, you know, like everybody goes, oh, wow, he must make a lot of money. But in, in the end of the day, when you're a brand new actor on the scene, you're not making an exorbitant amount of money. And of you know over fifty percent of that's going elsewhere before you're even, you know, putting it in the bank. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, it was it was it was trying. So I went for about four or five months, not working, auditioning, auditioning for everything, Dawson's Creek. I mean, you name it. Um, there were several shows. I, I actually, what had happened right towards the end of that contract? They had agreed we'd agreed to let me go, but I still had two more days on the show and I ended up booking, uh, gosh, what was, uh, what was the show with Scott Wolf and Lacey oh, Shep there? Um, I know what you're talking about. I'm, tr I'm trying to think, I, I, but I had booked the, the character Andrew Keegan had played. I was set to start that show and, and Bold and the Beautiful were like, well, it's not our problem. You got two more weeks to finish. So I lost that contract because of wow. it, which was a big blow. Not the first time that happened in my career, but, uh, but that's something you have to learn to deal with too. You go, wow, this is like, nothing is certain in this industry. You really have to, um, as much as you try to prepare for it, there's a, always that big anomaly, that big question mark that's there. I, I know you recently, well, not recently, but the last few years you left again from both the beautiful because the character left went out of the country uh do you foresee that coming back possibly uh for me no um no. you know I, I never i never say never but um i'm so busy these days um and i and i like what where i am um i like i've never have not really been out of a contract and i've been now it's almost been six years five can you believe it five six years since i've been wow. on the show um and I really wanted to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, for me artistically and what I really wanted out of this industry and what I learned in this industry and how can I share that. So I've been heavily involved with producing um, and that's really 
you know, in between acting jobs and things that I'm really wanting to go out for little film parts here, whatnot. But, um, there's going to be a major announcement that's going to be coming out in deadline and head, head uh, variety and Hollywood reporter very, very soon um, about a major motion picture that's in development now um, with my partner, Jason cook. And I, Jason cook, of course, is from general hospital days of our lives, but we've uh, we've been friends since we were very, very young. We, we produced a movie last year called four for fun. Um, which is currently this next week is going to be in, at the Portland International Film Festival in Oregon. So that's being screened up there. But we have a, a major motion picture that we have been greenlit for, and we are uh, very, very excited about it and really looking forward to making a, a larger announcement when it's time. Uh, I'll be looking for that, and maybe you can come back after that and share a little more. Absolutely. Uh, well, after The Bold and Beautiful, the first round, you went on – to star in a very huge role as Lucky Spencer in General Hospital. Right, yeah. Uh, what was that like changing? Because they're totally different characters. Uh, yes. Yeah. Just... It, was, it, was, uh, it was difficult because at about that point, you know, those chat rooms were really becoming big and there was no regulations on what people could say. And it was, you know, there every every one of those shows had multiple chat rooms for General Hospital, Bold and Beautiful, all this, all the soap operas. And people did not like the fact that I was taking over a role that had been existing for a long time, Lucky Spencer. And, you know, I, I mean, I can't blame him. You get used to one thing and then the next thing you know, it's, you know, somebody else there. But you know, that was also the consensus of Jeannie Francis and Tony Geary. They didn't want the character recast either, but it was going to happen with or without them. Oh, wow. Um, they had both okay. objected to the character being recast. So I went in and had an upward battle the entire way and fighting, you did. For, fighting for just my, my position on the show. Um, and, you know, I mean, Tony became a dear friend of mine. That was ne never, I never really had issues with him. Jeannie Francis was a little hard in the beginning. Uh, and, you know, I've talked about that openly too. We became friends eventually too, but she was really uh, just had a really, really hard time accepting the fact that I was going to be playing her son. But, you know, a year later I won an Emmy for the role. So it I was, was going to say you showed them because you yeah, won so, the... <laughs> so that I, was know, awesome. I brought, you know, I brought a, I, I was, you know, I had a wonderful storyline that was written for me. I was, you know, working with, uh, you know, Constance, Connie Towers. I was working with her yes. and, and she was amazing. And so like all those people working with Tony Geary, of course, and Elizabeth Hendrickson, I mean, just all lended, lended itself to the role. And, um, it ultimately became a really nice story. And, uh, but again, like, uh, was it was a very competitive place to work and, um, I knew at that point I had come to do what I wanted to do there at that show. And in, at the end of my third year contract, I decided that I was going to be leaving. Um, and partially because of Jill Farron Phelps, um, to be completely honest, she, she didn't want to give me a raise at the end of my three year contract. And I was still very low pay grade on, as far as the, the acting scale had the Emmy win under my belt and they didn't want to budge. So I left and, I don't think she ever realized that I was going to do that. I just walked. I was like, okay, see you. And, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, from that point I, I went on to work on, uh, the girl next door, uh, searchlight film, which is, you know, probably, you know, uh, it's become a cult classic. It's a great, it has. great, funny, funny film, great actors, Paul Dano, um, you know, Alicia Cuthbert, Emile Hirsch, uh, Timothy Oliphant, like just a great cast. And, had a time of my life. Uh, I was getting ready to probably get on another film, but that's when Julie Carruthers, who was, was the producer of Port Charles, the spinoff of General Hospital, she remembered how I was treated when I left, when I left and not getting the raise. And she said, I'd like to talk to you about a little something and called me to have a lunch with her. And I met with her and my manager. And she goes, we want to offer you two roles on all my children. You can either play Michael Knight's son or you can play David Canary's son. Which do you want to play? And I, I, my mom had watched all my children for years, so I, I was already very aware of those characters on the show. 
plus already being a veteran in daytime already at that point that I said, I wanted to play David Canary's son, of course. And, um, they made it right with me on that contract. Um, uh, they, they moved me back to new, I moved to New York. I uprooted from Los Angeles, single guy starting over in New York city. It was very exciting. And, um, Probably hands down, my favorite role I've ever played was J.R. Chandler on All My Children. Uh, uh, that's the one that I know best is your character on My Children. I mean, I, I can't imagine you playing Jamie or one of the others. I mean, you are you are Jr. To me, you are because I can't imagine anybody playing that role. But you, you well, did a phenomenal I, job. I appreciate that. It, I mean, I also had a lot of support. I mean, David Canary was a, you know, he's oh just gosh. was a magnate of, of, of a man and a persona and the sweetest man to work with. And he was so giving as an actor that you couldn't help but be caught up in his every moment, hang on every word. Um, he became a real a friend and a real father figure to me. The first, you know, month that I was there on All My Children, he thought I was absolutely insane, but I asked him if I could go to lunch with him and I would do it every single day. So I would be able to get to know him so we could create a relationship. He's like, but I just right. go up. He's like, I just go up to this bodega up here and get a really big salad every day. <laughs> and I'm like, that sounds great. Let me hang out with you. And so that's, we created a bond very early on him and I. Uh, that had to be, uh, even as big as you were, they had to be kind of intimidating to meet him for the first time because he's been in so he was in so much. Plus, he was playing two characters on the same show. Yeah, yeah a true story. That I, I had seen him play Stewart over the years, of course, but I was on set and I finally was. It was finally. I guess it was probably like six months later, or maybe it was a little earlier than that. But he played Stewart, and he had scenes with Jr. Just one on one. And I almost couldn't hold it together because I was so moved. Like I was like, I wanted to laugh with excitement and joy that this man was like transforming to this other man in front of me. It was like, it was just magic to watch. And like, I got caught up and I had to catch myself and get myself back into my performances because it was so honest and beautiful. Well, he played Stuart. I mean, he played both roles so well, but he played Stuart so convincing. I mean, you, when you see Stuart, you just wanted to go up hugging. Yeah. <laughs> and Adam, you just wanted to get away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So uh, what was it like working with uh, Susan Lucci and Michael Knight and Caddy McCain? It Payne, was, sorry. It was, uh, it was wonderful. I mean, Susan is, it was, you know, there's a reason why she had, let, you know, been such a, I know, she's a queen of daytime. There's a reason for that. There's a reason that the show lasted as long as it did. It's because it was great leadership like Susan Lucci, like Michael Knight, you know, like uh, Katie McLean or Eva LaRue or Cameron Matheson, Alicia, like all those people. Sure. Yeah, just were an absolute joy to work with. We really hung out after work a lot. Everybody was like, hey, what are you guys doing? You guys want to? go over here and grab a drink and have some pasta. And like there was a real camaraderie that I'd never had on any of the other shows I've ever worked on. I always have one or two friends, but they made it their business to make sure that they were in the, uh, you know, that every, everybody was in each other's lives enough. Well, I mean, back to your character, you had one of the rare opportunities. You got to cross over. You crossed over to all my children with the storyline with babe and, the baby and yeah yeah from um, all my children to one life to live right sorry that, that, yeah that was that was an interesting story needless to say it was uh it was kind of fun you know one day i'd be working on all my children and and i'd have to like right after i was done with my scenes roll over to one life to live and and then back and forth and so on so that was a, a really that was exciting oh it was for the fans seeing you know jr and bianca i mean and you know that was just incredible crossover yeah it was it's a great storyline yeah with the buchanans yes the buchanans you had some of them do you have a favorite part that you played i mean i know it's kind of hard to say i like this one that one because they're all so different yeah i mean i don't know i mean you know, I, I love it anytime I can delve into a character that's 
really character driven, you know, because I've always had to play for the most part, the patriarch son, you know, somebody who's a little more put together, but I like, I like wild, crazy characters. You know, I just did this film called blood before Bitcoin that uh, I'm a producer on that film too. We finished filming that a, uh, two months ago. It's currently in post-production, but um, you know, I play this, this burnt out actor that never made it in Hollywood. And he's living at this hotel. It's way on the outskirts of the desert. Um, I mean, in no, no man's land, literally in no man's land. And, you know, he just, he hates his life and, you know, he's, you know, he said, you know, he does, you know, drugs and like, it's just like, he's a wonky, you know, out there guy. He's got crazy ambitions but you know can never you know rub two pennies together he's you know so i thought i thought that was a lot of fun to delve into that character and uh Sounds very interesting yeah it is it's a, it's, a, it's a you know it's a suspense thriller well i got a big question for you where do you see the fate of soap operas going from here well With i guess of our lives just switched over to to web base yeah so i mean i saw all of this coming when all my, well, I mean, when I started, there's a lot of shows still on air. 12 shows were still on the air. Um, and they just slowly started going one by one. So I, I knew that this has been coming and it's no secret. We all talked about it too, for years. Cause we're always like, are we next on the chopping block or who's going to be the next show to go? And with all my children, you know, I, I saw, I saw that happening and i went through that and i experienced that and i saw them try to put it into you know like a digital format that was very early on i don't you know netflix wasn't even really going i think or maybe barely um so there was just no real digital platforms for it um i do see some of these shows making that transition but what i find like like days of our lives is those budgets are going to be cut up. Um, they're going to fire half of the cast or they're going to, you know, do it on a show by show basis without a contract. Um, that's the only way those shows can survive. Uh, and when I decided to exit, they were just making too much demands on actors in my personal opinion. Not that I couldn't handle it. Not that anybody that's there that was trained couldn't handle it. But I mean, when I first started, we would shoot one episode a day, maybe one and a half episodes by the time, you know, I was, I walked away, we were doing eight to 10 episodes in four days and wow. then taking Friday off. I mean, that's, that's hundreds and hundreds of pages of dialogue memorized. And I just, I started losing faith, unfortunately, like in the quality, the quality that I was putting out there, the quality that everybody else was doing, the quality of the writing, everything was suffering because of it's that hurry up mentality. Right. So I, I, that's why I decided truly that it was time. I was not going to be the last. So, so to go down with the ship, so <laughs> shit. to speak, you know, I, I didn't want to, I don't want to have that anymore. And I, I, I realized I haven't given myself enough opportunities to really pursue the dreams that Jacob wanted to. Um, and some people go, Oh, but that's a dream job. Sure. It's a dream job, but artistically limiting. And I needed to explore myself a little bit more. Do you think you would return to Pine Valley with Kelly Ripa, Mark Consuelo's oh. show? Oh yeah, one hundred percent. You know, if that if it was ever to come back, I know there was talk about it, but I don't know if that's all waylaid now or on the side. But if they ever do that and they want to have me on there, I'd be more than happy. I love all those guys. Well, I've tried to play it out in my head a little bit, you know, and I can see that they're not going to really be able to bring in the older actors maybe susan lucci for a guest appearance or something but it falls on the next generation you know jr you know all of the all of them yeah. kelly ripa's character all of them yeah no it would definitely be they would be like more of the parents and they would i would imagine it would be more like um like a focusing on younger even like the kids of the kids like outer banks type sort of thing right where you'd have or you know like dynasty and they have the, the younger kids that are younger adults that are in there as well so yeah i would see that but i think you know from everything i read they were really going to be focusing a lot more on uh some of the kane family and and whatnot which is which is right. fine but you know to tell the story organically they would definitely need those 
cameos of people coming in. Right. For sure. Well, you recently were in the, the season finale, or not the season finale, the series finale of The Walking Dead as Dever, Dever, sorry. What was that experience like? That had to be just... Oh, it was, I was a fan of the show. I, and I really, well, you know, when I, when I, some of the auditions had come up, I was, I was like, yeah, I don't care how small or big the role is. I definitely want to, you know, be a part of it in some way. I have to say it was probably the largest production I'd ever been on, you know, outside of a major motion picture. Uh, it was just unreal how many components, uh, just how much detail goes into that show. Yeah, I'm shooting on multiple cameras simultaneously, uh, the special effects and bullets and flying on like, you know, just explosions. And I mean, just really an amazing production and a really pleasure to work with the, the entire walking dead team. They were, uh, I mean, everybody from production to, I mean, you name it, the actors, just really amazing people. So it was, uh, it was like, uh, it was like a kind of a pinch myself moment for me. Well, maybe, maybe you can make a, the next season, make the move over to the boys with all the rest of the supernatural people. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know there was talk of this, there's this, the stories from the walking dead or tales from the walking dead, which kind of highlights different groups that were going on. And uh, there might be a, a little spinoff. I don't know. Angela Kang started following us all on social media. So I think I'm hoping that that meant that the showrunner was like, well, I'm going to follow them and keep tabs on them. And when it's time, we'll, we'll bring back the Reapers. Well, I actually heard that they were going to do two spinoffs from that show. Yeah. They've got a lot of them. I think there's a, there's, there's a feature film that's in the works right now. Mm -hmm. And there's the, the, um, uh, what is the, they got the they got the tales of the Walking Dead, and then there was just gonna be like a Daryl Carol, but then like she yeah. decided that she didn't want to do it. But I think they're still gonna uh, move move forward. So there's I don't know I don't know what uh what's all gonna entail, but they're they're gonna keep that franchise is it's so big their studio is massive down there in Atlanta, and of course they you know they they rent out buildings buildings <laughs> when, right. they, when they do those scenes it's just wild. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's it's kind of like uh, Game of Thrones, you know what they've done. They they've got the pre uh, the prequel out now, but I've heard there's two more shows coming off of it now too. Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, it's smart, you know. If you've got the audience, stay with it. For sure, for sure. During the work on all these shows, you were working on your music. Yeah. Yeah. I've listened to a lot of your songs here lately. Like, they're phenomenal. Phenomenal. Wow. If you, nobody's listened to them, you need to. Uh, does it come easy to you? Does writing and all of that? I mean, because you do it all on your songs. You do the music and the lyrics. Yeah, you know, so, I mean, it's, you know, writing has always been an outlet for me in a major way of just dealing with feelings and emotions and being able to get that off my chest or even just playing music. Uh, my wife will be the first one to tell you, like when she knows I'm in my office and I'm playing music, that's my, my, my time. That's my decompressing time to wind down from the day or just, you know, blow off some steam. So it, uh, it was never really a, a ch too much of a challenge. I mean, yeah, you, there's a lot of, you have to learn about writing a song and structure wise and how that works out. But I don't know, lyrically, it's always been pretty easy for me. And uh, to put a little tell tune and a melody together. But, um, you know, I, I can only explain it this way. Like people go, you know, it's a lot of people like, well, what is he trying to prove? And I, the first thing I can tell you is I didn't do it for anybody else. I did it for myself. I did it because I enjoy these little treasures that I'm able to make in my life. I pay for them to be produced. I put them together. I hire, rent out the studio. I hire the mixers, you know, the producer, everybody. And, uh, I do it so I can have a little, a little something. And, and if somebody enjoys it, then great. I mean, I, I like to be able to show, I, my kids know, I mean, my, my daughter's inspired by music and by, by what I've done. And, you know, she's, she's a great little musician, but that was the whole idea is I wanted something to, 
share with my kids and go, hey, I, I do some of that too. What do you think? Let's go sing a song together. So it's it's a great it's a great outlet. Uh, well, I'm a firm believer that if you've got a talent and you don't use it, you're just wasting it. And that's that's a terrible thing to do. And you are multi-talented. I mean, you just are. Oh, okay. uh, along with your music, I found out that you played a role of Lumineer. I'm probably saying that wrong, on Disney's Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so L Lumiere. Yeah. Lumiere. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I sure did. I mean, that was that was a very big highlight of my career. Yep, there there he is, a co <laughs> costume and all. I remember the day when we took that photo. So I had already been doing all the dance rehearsals. I'd already been rehearsing the scenes at nauseum, the songs at nauseum, and I remember this was one week out before my put in, which is anybody doesn't know what a put in is. It's it's without an audience, and you only really get one of those. And so you're hoping that your, your, your dress rehearsal is going to be great. Well, I remember putting that costume on and I looked over at the managing producer and I was like, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> I mean, first of all, it's a fire retardant suit, as everybody can kind of see. It's, it's like a sleeping bag, really. It, it and, looks hot. <laughs> and, and, and that's velvet that I'm wearing yes. on another jacket, another layer. There's a shirt that's underneath all of that. Then you oh, got the, sho the shoulder pads. And that velvet jacket obviously goes all the way up to the hands and the hands um, have gas lines running in them. So they actually, they light up. There's butane packs on your back. Um, and you, you literally have these like old fashioned levers that you have to open up and, you know, you, 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 you press what is basically a taser mechanism and it, it fires. Oh, and cool. yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's like, Hey you, mom, I know you always told me not to play with fire, but what do you think about this? <laughs> Um, but, uh, but it was, it was a blast. It was, it was difficult to get used to that costume, I have to say, but I had the time of my life. Lumiere sings the longest song in Broadway history, um, yes. and, with a 36 piece orchestra every night. And I was only supposed to do the show for three months cause I was doing all my children simultaneously. And the numbers for Beauty and the Beast had just was, were staggering. They'd gone up from they were like the 20th show about to close to the top 10. And they were so thankful. They asked me to stay on another three months. So I, uh, I was doing TV during the morning and doing Broadway at night every single day. And Disney did not own ABC at that time. <laughs> oh, actually they did. They oh, did. did they? Yeah. But they never, oh. they never really talked to each other. It was never like, you know, ABC family was there too. Disney was our parent company. I mean, our checks that we would get from all my children had the mouse on it. It was Disney. Oh, okay. So, you know, they, they, they did, but it was, uh, but it was interesting because they, you know, they don't, didn't think about ever cross promoting people that were working with on, you know, ABC versus Disney and the managing producer, Mark Rosano, who believed in this from the day one, me coming up onto the show, he saw me perform, at a Broadway cares benefit, I sang a song and he had heard me. So he said, we would love it if you would audition for Lumiere, you know? So, so we, you know, after talking me into it, that was, you know, so, but he believed in this synergy. So he basically made sure that all of the press outlets had uh, the, the press release about me coming on. And that morning when it was released, and this is the story that he tells me, he, he put a stack of press releases on Tom Schumacher, who's the head of Disney on Broadway, Lion King, yes. all of those. Um, and Tom Schumacher looked over and goes, who the hell did we just hire? <laughs> and so from there on, they decided to invest in a, a commercial. Uh, brought, it was on, ran on ABC and CBS um, every day during, in New York and Connecticut and pretty much all over the Eastern board. I, so many people like, yeah, we came to see you because we saw your commercial. It was like such a great <laughs> press uh, package that they put together for that show. I had the time of my life. I mean, it, it was hard, but I had the time of my life. I had a, a beautiful car service that would pick me up from my home, take me to the studio, from the studio to the Broadway theater. It was, I never had to, you know, catch a cab or do anything like that. They totally catered to, to, the, to me working there. So... It was uh, a really wonderful time in my life. 
it, it had it looks like fun i mean a lot of work but fun um well since then you've been working on some movies off and on um one in particular that i really did a little research on uh that we were talking about before the show uh jim fitzpatrick will be on soon uh can you tell us a little bit about that movie yeah, so Jim Fitzpatrick, yeah, Jim Fitzpatrick has written a great script, and it's based on his life because he was a football player. His brothers were football players. Um, and this is a story about um, a bunch of dads who basically get laid off from their mill, and their sons are in a uh, in college-level football, and they're having a horrible year, and they've had a whole horrible year the year before. So they decide that they want to help out their team, but it's a uh, it's, uh, it's funny because it's you know it's a football comedy, right? It has a little bit of everything in it. It's got a little drama in there. It's got a little sadness. It's got a little bit of everything. It's a nice it's a nice little uh, a picture. So there's a lot of people that have already agreed to be a part of this cast. Everybody from Stone Cold Steve Austin to if you're a WWF fan, Chris Jericho. Um, you know, it even got like uh, Dan Marino in it making a cameo. Jim yeah. Kelly. So it's just a really cool cast, and I'm I'm really pleased to be a part of that film. And um, right now we're closing on on the rest of the financing, and we're going to go into production as soon as that's uh, as soon as it's it's ready to go. Yeah, it sounds awesome. I mean, what what I've found out about it, it sounds really great. Um, well, I guess I need to talk about your podcast, Real Conversations with Jacob Young. They're phenomenal. I've been listening to them all week. Uh, you've got several on there uh how'd that come about yeah so um so yeah we're, we're currently on my i think my 94th episode um you know you can listen to it everywhere you know spotify to you know apple music or you know podcasts anywhere everywhere you can get you know podcasts from some of them i've put on youtube some of them i haven't um it just really depends i do i do film every single one of them for mo mostly for um promotional reasons you know just to get people listening but um, so years ago, um, I made a relationship with Boys Town, and that's really kind of how this podcast came together. Uh, I have, you know, I share so much with the Boys Town organization and what they are doing to change these kids' lives in there. And I, I wanted to find something that wasn't hitting people over the head so much necessarily with mental health, but also dealing with the struggles of mental health and, and what a lot of my guests have had to do to come overcome those. Now, some people are more than willing to open up. Some people are not, you know, some people are a little more closed off, but um, I find more and more and more people are willing to share a lot more than what I anticipated, which I, I think is great. So, um, so yeah, so I'm uh, through this podcast, I'm helping to spread the word and all the good works that go on at Boys Town, a charity that I'm very close to. And, um, I've just been really proud of the success that it's gathered, um, the audience that is listening. It's been a real, it's been a real treat for me. Um, it's 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 a lot of work to to do a podcast once a week, but uh, especially if you have other things that you're juggling, like <laughs> three kids and three dogs and all these other jobs that I'm working on. But um, I really I, I find it's uh, if it changes one life somebody gets something from it, well, then I've done my job with it. Well, you've, I mean, you've got some great guests. Do you have any uh, that you can share that's coming up when you're going to guess? Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've been in talks. I mean, he's already agreed to do it, Roger Clemens. Roger Clemens said he was going to jump on. Um, that'll be cool. Yeah, I think that'll be great. I mean, I, I hung out with him when I was in Sedona for a film festival out there, and he invited me over for karaoke. And we had a time <laughs> of our lives. So I've, I talked to him back and forth. He, if any time I text him, he texts me immediately right back. So he's he's an awesome guy. Um, so eventually I'll have him on. Um, I've got coming up uh, a couple of the Sopranos guys coming up from the TV series. Uh, you know, just kind of you know some some sports figures. I like some some nostalgic role people from older movies too. So I've got some stuff that's coming up regarding uh, some classics, some film classics. Well. You have two other roles that are probably the most important roles of your life. That's husband and father. Oh yes, there they are. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's that's Molly is on my lap, my son Luke in the middle, and Grace on the right. And 
my beautiful wife, Kristen, who has been my absolute rock and um, has, you know, every, has seen me through good, bad, emotionally and, and great successes and not such great successes. And it's just, you know, I, uh, I couldn't see having a life without them. We've been married, my wife and I, for 15 years and uh, we're, you know, we've known each other for 17 so I don't, you know, I don't think she's going anywhere and I don't think <laughs> I'm going anywhere. So well, I told her, I said, we might as well stay together. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, are any of the kids showing signs or interested to the business going into show business? Yeah. You know, you know, I mean, I think any kid this day and age has, you know, cause everybody's got a cell phone in their hand, right? So everybody can do a TikTok video. Anybody can do a reels on Instagram. Um, so, you know, I, I, yes, I mean, they all kind of are already doing those things. Almost every kid out there is, so they all have a right. desire. My son, uh, he takes class um, because I own a acting, a virtual acting company um, called um, Work With Working Actors. My partner, Trent Garrett. Um, if you remember all my children, Amanda Baker, she's also one of my teachers. Brittany Sarpy from Young and the Restless is also one of my teachers. Um, Jason Blair was on several different primetime shows. So we got a great group of instructors and we have multiple classes and it's kind of taken on a life of its own. So, so we have kids classes, we got adult classes, uh, and my daughter and my son both take those classes, but I want them to continue taking classes. I don't want them, I want them to still have a childhood and I feel like I'd rather them experience the arts through school, study now, and they can make that decision when they get a little bit older, like getting ready to go to college. Right. I've, I've just been the father of too many kids on TV series where I've just, I've just seen them grow up a little too fast. If you know what I mean? Oh, for sure. I mean, and to have to be so conditioned at that age, at such a young age. Yeah. Um, how did you and your wife meet? If I may ask, was it in the business? Yeah, we were, oddly enough, we were, uh, we were at a mutual friends, uh, party in New York city and we didn't know each other, but we both had known the same guy that was throwing the party. And yeah, I mean, I, I remember I didn't want to go to that party that night. I, I think I had just flown in from somewhere like an appearance or something. I was just incredibly beat and Aiden Turner, who was on all my children, he calls me and he's like, mate, are we going to Amish's house? And I'm like, well, I said, no, I don't plan on it. I'm, I'm, I'm super tired. And he's like, we already pulled up outside your apartment. I'm like, oh, <laughs> dear Lord. Uh, so I ended up going and thankfully I did because I met her that night. That's cool. I guess it was kind of a connection right off. I won't yeah. say love at first sight, but. Oh, no, it wasn't because um, we had a really great time getting to know each other and we went on a a walk in central park to get to know each other even more than another day. And, um, it was just very strained and it was very unusual and I couldn't get her to really talk as much. And it was just, it was really bizarre. So, um, I don't know. I just, I didn't call her back after that. <laughs> no. and, and several weeks went by and a good friend of mine, a Greek guy by the name of John Kutianis, He's a very uh, famous like dentist in New York. He's a good friend. He um, he ended up calling me and he goes, "I've met this girl. I think she's the girl for me. I think she's going to be the one, you know." <laughs> and he's like, "Do you have anybody to do on a double date? I want you to meet her." And I said, "Uh, yeah, there's this one girl I kind of dated recently. I'll see what she's up to." And <laughs> uh, so I call her back and the next thing you know, she ends up uh, she was she was more uh, the same girl I met the night before. And anyway, there was, there was a, there's a whole long story there where she ends up throwing <laughs> up on me in the cab and, uh, oh, no. it was, and, but, but I have to say there's something about something that's real like that when there is all the pretenses fall to the side and there's just nothing left but pure honesty and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And that's when I fell in love with her. When I saw that, when I knew I could, needed to help her and that she knew she needed help from me. And then, right. yeah, so that's when the real connection happened. Well, do you have any uh, cooking shows in the works? I recently <laughs> saw one of you cooking, cooking steak 
in two different types of pans, which you cook beautiful steaks. I mean, I've got to say they were gorgeous. Oh, Me I is love- a beef coming from a beef farmer, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I I I love cooking. Um, I don't have any cooking shows. I was I was literally messing around. Uh, well, I you know I I gotten this campaign during the COVID lockdown and. You know, we couldn't go anywhere, so they sent the meat. They sent those beautiful pans to me, and and so I said, "Yeah, I'll do a little cooking segment." But you know, I I would never be opposed to that. It's a lot of work, though, because like just to do it one person, like I didn't have the right setup at that time. It was COVID lockdown. You couldn't get anything ordered anyway because everybody was buying everything up um, at that time. But uh, you know, you need like one of those cameras, a little jib camera coming from above to get the food shot, you know, you need a couple camera angles going on. So if I had a little studio set up, I think I would, I would enjoy that. I mean, I did a little cooking segment and people could find this one. I, I recently found it again on, uh, I was on the talk and I did a cooking segment with, uh, um, Chris Jenner and a couple other people. So, Oh, that had to be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was interesting, but, uh, but yeah, so I enjoyed it. I actually, you know, I felt like I was, I'm watching, I'm like, man, man, you're just as good as Bobby Flay. Well, the video that you have up, I mean, you did it exactly the way any, the best do. You described everything. You're very, very descriptive about it and very good at showing when you cut into it and talking about the difference. So, you know, yeah. you know, okay. Maybe one Cooking day, network. Never, never say never. <laughs> Look out, Food Network. <laughs> okay, before we go, I want to play a little name game with you. Say okay. the, if you don't mind saying the first thing that comes to mind when I say these names. Okay. Catherine Kelly Lang. Ah, uh, beautiful. John McCook. Uh, dashing. <laughs> Caddy McLean. Uh, motherly. David Canary. Um, unstoppable. Susan Lucci. Uh, Queen and Kristen Stewart. Uh, Kristen Stewart, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Is that who you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I told you I had a surprise one. <laughs> Blessed. Blessed. That's it. You all really need to check out Jacob's podcast of music to keep up with all that's going on to follow him on his social media. You can find his link tree and there's the link to his YouTube show, Real Conversations with Jacob Young, where you can listen to all his podcasts. Jacob, thank you for talking with me today. I'm so thrilled that you were here. Oh, thank you, Tim. I really appreciate it. And thanks for all the great questions. And again, I hope you do come back uh, soon because uh, you're definitely a friend of the show for sure. Oh, thank you. I'll, <laughs> I'll be more than willing to come back. If you want to hang out backstage for just a minute, I'll be right back there. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more great shows like this one. I'd like to thank the NFF for sponsoring the show. Thank you for tuning in. Please remember to be kind. See you next time. Have a great day.